In lab this week, you're going to be asking yourself two questions. You're going to be asking, what is the tonicity of Kool-Aid relative to a 10% sucrose solution? And you'll be asking, what condition will most disrupt the structure of beat cell membranes? Let's talk about the first part. So in order to understand what the tonicity of Kool-Aid is relative to a 10% sucrose solution, we need you need to understand what tonicity is. Tonicity is the ability of a solution to cause a cell to either gain or lose water. So in this particular experiment, the cell that we will be using is a uh, dialysis tubing that has been tied at two ends and filled with a 10% sucrose solution. And then we can incubate that mock cell in a beaker with other solutions. So in this particular example, we are incubating the uh, dialysis tubing in a beaker of 0% sucrose solution. And when we talk about tonicity, what you first must do is look at the two solutions that we're comparing. In this particular case, we're comparing the outside solution, solution 1, to the solution inside the membrane, solution 2. When you compare those two solutions, the solution that is the higher solute concentration, so solute being sucrose, um, is going to be the hypertonic solution. So hyper means more or higher, and that is the sucrose solution. So solution two is the hypertonic solution. Hypo means lower. That's going to be the solution of the two solutions, the solution of the lower solute concentration. So in this case, 0% sucrose is lower than 10% sucrose. So our solution number one out here is hypotonic. Now, if the two solutions were the same concentration of solute, same is iso, and so they would be isotonic to one another. Now, once you have defined what those two solutions, the relationship uh, between each other, which one's the hypertonic, which one's the hypotonic, then you can predict which way water, or the net direction of the flow of water. And water always flows from the hypotonic solution to the hypertonic solution. So, since we've defined this solution out here as the hypo, because it has less or a lower solute concentration. And here inside is the hyper because it has the higher concentration of solute, of sucrose. Then we know water is gonna flow from the hypo from outside to inside the bag. This is the um, a sort of um, thing that you are going to be working with today uh, or this week in lab. You will be setting up three controls that Based on what you know about tonicity, they should behave in a very predictable way that you should be able to um, should be able to predict. You will set up one, two, three dialysis tubing bags, each one of them with 10% sucrose in them. You will then tie them off, weigh them and then incubate them in three different solutions, a 10% sucrose solution, a 0% sucrose solution, and a 30% sucrose solution. They will be incubated there for several hours, at which point there is going to be a flow of water, either inside the bag or outside the bag, or maybe no change at all. After you're done, you will then take those dialysis tubing again, weigh them again and figure out what was the net change in mass of those dialysis tubing. Did they gain water? Did they lose water? Or was there no net change of water within that dialysis tubing? And it's through that net change in mass that you will be able to determine which was the um, the hypotonic, hypertonic, and isotonic solutions. However, remember, based on the information given here, based on how you set this up, you should already know what you will see. For example, here we have 10% inside, 10% outside. That means those solutions are isotonic to each other, and that means the net change in water 
will be zero. So there should be no change in mass of this particular dialysis tube. If this dialysis tubing uh, was a actual cell, it would be very happy to be in an isotonic solution. Let's take a look here. Here we have on the inside is 10%, on the outside is 0%, so it's hypertonic on the inside, hypo on the outside, and water is going to flow into that bag in this particular situation. Okay, because our, our little bag has been put into a hypotonic solution. It will therefore increase in mass in the experiment. If it was a cell, if it was an actual cell, it would lice open as water entered there and just blew up that cell. And in our third control, we have 10% on the inside, we have 30% on the outside. That means the outside now is hypertonic, the inside is hypotonic. Water always flows from hypo to hyper, in this case, from inside the bag to outside the bag, which means this bag is going to decrease in mass. If, again, if this was an actual cell that was put into a hypertonic solution, water would rush out of that cell into the surrounding solution and the cell would shrivel. So, based on what you know about hypertonic solutions and hypotonic solutions and water flow, you should be able to predict the behavior of your controls and know whether your controls worked as they should or if you have done something wrong. Now comes the experimental. In the experimental, you're going to have that same 10% uh, di that's dialysis tubing filled with 10% sucrose solution. In this case, however, you're going to put it into Kool-Aid. Now, we know that we make Kool-Aid with sucrose, so we know we've got sucrose dissolved in that Kool-Aid, but we don't know how much. So the only way in which you're going to figure out that tonicity of your Kool-Aid relative to what's inside that bag is to figure out what was the net flow of water. Did it go into the bag? Did it leave the bag? Or was there really no change in the mass of that bag? Okay, so this is your experimental. It's going to be that change in mass of the dialysis tubing that's going to give you that answer of what is the tonicity of Kool-Aid relative to 10% sucrose solution. Okay, let's move on to the next one. The next one is we're going to look at factors that can affect the stability, can affect the structure of a membrane. Now remember, membranes are roughly 50% phospholipids and uh, phospholipid bilayer and roughly 50% embedded proteins. So any condition, any chemical that affects the structure of lipids or proteins will affect the structure of a membrane. And remember, the function of a membrane is to let things in, let things out, or keep things out, or keep things in. If you affect the structure of the membrane, you will, of course, affect the function. And if you affect the function of the membrane, suddenly things that are supposed to be inside the cell can get out. And that's what we're going to take advantage of this week. We're going to take advantage of the fact that beat cells, in every beat cell, there is a purple pigment called beta cyanin. And if that membrane is intact, the beta cyanin stays within the cell and the surrounding solution stays clear. However, if you subject these beat cells to something that disrupts the structure of the membrane, you will, of course, then disrupt the function of the membrane. And therefore, that beta cyanin will begin to leak through that disrupted membrane into the surrounding solution and turning it purple. Which means the more purple that surrounding solution becomes, the more we have disrupted the structure of the membrane, and therefore the more of the beta cyanin has leaked out of the cell into the surrounding solution. Now, how are we going to measure just how purple the surrounding solution has become? And the answer is yes. A spectrophotometer. So you've worked with spectrophotometers before and now you're going to work with one again. This time though we won't tell you what 
wavelength of light beta cyanin best absorbs. You're going to do that yourself. And the way you're going to do it is you're going to take some purified beta cyanin. You're going to put it in the spectrophotometer. You're going to set the spectrophotometer at 400 nanometer wavelength of light and figure out the absorbance. And then you'll hit that wavelength to four, uh, adjust the wavelength to 410 nanometers and take the absorbance. And you're going to do that every 10 nanometers all the way to 700. So at this point, you will have a wavelength and a corresponding absorbance that you will make a graph. You can do that in Google Sheets. You can also eyeball the data, but I want you to make the graph as well. But either way, what you're going to find is there's going to be a very specific wavelength that has the highest absorbance, and that is the wavelength of light that you are going to use to do your experiment. Well, what's your experiment going to be? It is going to be, you're going to take cores of beet, so uh, hunks of beet, and you're going to subject them to several different conditions. You're going to subject them to nothing, just a pH 7 buffer control. That's going to be your control. Okay, We haven't done anything special to the beet cells. Then you're going to subject some beets to detergent, extreme high temperature, extreme low temperature, organic solvent like methanol, low pH and high pH. And in each case, you'll subject that uh, for a particular amount of time. You will remove the beet cells leaving the um, surrounding solution behind, which, depending on how much you've damaged the membrane, will be either very purple or not so purple, and then you will use a spectrophotometer to measure the absorbance of that surrounding solution. The higher the absorbance, the more purple that solution is, which means the more beta cyanin leaked out of the cell, which means the more that the particular condition you tested affected the structure or disrupted the structure of the cell membrane. That is your assay. Measuring the absorbance of the solution in which the beet core was incubated, and the higher the absorbance of that solution, the more damage that was done to the structure of the membrane.